Hello everyone. So in previous videos I've talked to you about how if you want to estimate the cost of equity or the cost of debt, you can do that using the capital asset pricing model. So for the sake of simplicity, let's assume that we are living in a world in which we have a firm that is 100% equity funded. In this case, the rate of return that equity holders require, which is their cost of equity, would also be the cost of capital because equity is the only source of capital. And to calculate that cost of equity, you can use capital asset pricing model as the rate of return that equity holders require, which is equal to the risk-free rate plus the equity beta into the expected market risk premium. So if we know what the risk-free rate is, if we know what the equity beta is, if we know what the expected market risk premium is, then we can calculate the rate of return that equity holders require, which would be the cost of equity and hence the cost of capital. But what if these inputs are not given? What if the risk-free rate is not given? What if the equity beta or the expected market risk premium are not given? Then how do we estimate them? Well, in this specific video, I wanna to talk to you about how you can estimate just the risk-free rate. So here are some uh, general guidelines. First, uh, when we think about the risk-free rate, this is the rate of return that we can earn without, of course, taking on any risk. In general, at least in the US, the asset that we associate as being risk-free is the rate of return that you can earn by investing in government bonds. So when the US government borrows money from you, we tend to consider that as risk-free. Why? Because the government will always pay you back. Even if it doesn't have the money, well, it has the authority to print money and it can always print more money and pay you. Now, the same cannot be said of all governments. Uh, there are a lot of governments in third world countries which have historically defaulted on their debt. There are some today which are at the risk of defaulting also. But at least here in the US, we associate government bonds or what are also called treasuries as risk-free. The other thing to keep in mind is that we want to use the prevailing rates, not the historical averages. This is a very, very important point. To understand this fully, consider the following situation. Imagine that you are a financial manager who has a bunch of assets and you have historically funded them with equity. And now you're planning to raise some additional equity to invest in additional assets and uh, you need to figure out the cost of equity so you want to use the risk-free rate as one of the inputs into the capital asset pricing model. When you will go to your equity holders and say please give me $100,000 because I want to inject that money into certain assets, the equity holders will say you know what when we will give you our money we will forego the opportunity to invest this $100,000 elsewhere. What will we forego? At least the risk-free rate that prevails today. If today the risk-free rate that prevails is something like 5%, then it doesn't really matter if historically over the past, say, 10 years, the average was, say, 3% or whatever, because our perspective is always forward-looking. Equity holders won't say, oh, I care about this 3% because that is the historical average. They'll say, no, when I'm giving you this $100,000, I'm losing out on the opportunity today to earn risk-free 5% elsewhere. In fact, this is good segue into the third point, which is that you usually want to use a risk-free rate on a bond whose time to maturity matches with the life of the investment itself. If we are taking $100,000 from our equity holders and looking to invest it in a project whose useful life is only five years, the equity holders will say, okay, I'll give you this $100,000, but in doing so, I'm losing out on the opportunity to earn at least the risk-free return that I could have earned on a five-year treasury. If instead we were using that $100,000 to invest in a long-term project, say a 30-year project, the equity holders would have argued, doing so, I'm losing out on the opportunity to earn the risk-free rate of return being offered by a 30-year treasury. Again, notice that our perspective is forward-looking. We're thinking about what rate of return equity holders could have earned risk-free over the next five years or over the next 30 years, depending on what kind of project they are funding today. So all else equal, we want to match the life of the investment with the time to maturity. So this is how you want to think about estimating the risk-free return to plug into the capital asset pricing model to estimate cost of equity or cost of debt.
If you found this video useful, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And feel free to ask any questions using the comment section. Happy learning.